Welcome to my lecture on Art and Nature, using art to celebrate and educate about nature's diversity. I'm Karen Johnson. I'm a natural science illustrator who runs a studio called Karen's Nature Art. I specialize in insects and plants and work in a variety of media, including ink, watercolor, and acrylic. I also make polymer clay and metal jewelry. Prairie sketches that I've done can be found in my Society 6 shop called Karen's Nature Art. Society6 is a print-on-demand company that prints your artwork on mugs, totes, cards, prints, and other objects. I also teach art classes at the Morton Arboretum. So what is my background? Ever since I was a little kid, I've been into bugs and insects. I raise them, I find them, I hunt them, take pictures of them. I've just enjoyed insects my whole entire life. So it was no surprise that when I went to college, I wanted to major in entomology. I went to Iowa State University, and three years into my entomology degree, I discovered that they had a major called Biological Pre-Medical Illustration. Since I've always liked art, I thought that would be really cool if I could combine my entomology with an art degree as well. So I added that on. So what does a biological illustrator do? In a nutshell, they use art to communicate science and scientific principles to the public or other scientists. Once you start looking around, you'll see illustrations everywhere. You'll see them in the news. I don't know if you've ever seen the COVID virus illustration, but that was done by a medical illustrator. You'll see illustrations in astronomy, new planets, new discoveries on Mars, in paleontology with new fossils, in archaeology, artists will reconstruct ancient civilizations. And parks and preserves will have art in their signage and guidebooks. The butterflies that you see here, I did for a Butterflies of Canada poster for a park up in Canada. Illustrations can also be used in textbooks and lab manuals. Here are some illustrations I did for the Manual of Entomology and Pest Management in their Morphology section, showing the different parts of the honeybee and the grasshopper. Corporations will also use illustrations. Seed companies, wine and tea companies, zoos, fabric designs, dish designs. A lot of these companies will use animal illustrations or plant illustrations. Ball Horticultural Company hired me to do these plant illustrations, including the tomato plant, which they put on a label. So it was really fun to see, go buy a tomato plant and find my tomato artwork on the label. They also hired me to do the series of illustrations on the left in the style of Leonardo da Vinci. It was a very interesting commission as I had to research Leonardo da Vinci's style, but simplify it in order for the flower to show up. It was used for promotional banners. The illustrations on the right were for Horticulture magazine, and they needed some illustrations for articles on the Blue Orchard Bee and the Citrus Mealy Bug. So, as I said, nature art can be found everywhere. Just keep your eyes open. Since I enjoyed doing the Leonardo da Vinci style drawings, I had the idea to do a series of paintings where a plant and its pollinator would be brought to life from a line drawing to a full color painting. In this way, I could show plant dissections, similar to da Vinci's anatomical dissections, in a way that was hopefully educational as well as beautiful. On the left is a large flowered bellwort, a woodland wildflower that blooms in the spring. It is pollinated by our native bees, including the black and gold bumblebee. On the right is a honeysuckle vine with its long tubular flowers, perfect for pollinators such as hummingbirds and sphinx moths like the snowberry clearwing moth. This moth is a bumblebee mimic and is often called the hummingbird moth. In 2011, I discovered polymer clay, a type of bakeable modeling clay that comes in a wide variety of colors, including translucent, metallic, and pearlescent. When combined with wire and beads, it can make quite realistic flowers and insects. After much practice and improvement, I figured out how to make them into jewelry and started wearing my favorite insects year-round. Every time I walked outside, I'd see flowers with interesting patterns and try to replicate them in the clay. 
Being able to wear these flowers year-round helped to make winter a little more bearable. It would remind me of trying to make daisy chains when I was a kid, except this time they wouldn't fall apart. In the fall of 2020, I was able to take a class in metalworking. Towards the end, we were required to make a more complicated piece, so I chose to do a locket. I wanted to show that bumblebees usually choose to nest underground in an abandoned rodent hole. With the teacher's help and the lab's machines, I was able to imprint the copper, form it into a locket, and then solder the parts together. I added the bee after the class. This is a special piece to me as I don't have access to these machines anymore. After the class, I had to figure out how to cut and solder metal using my own supplies and what I could do with it within those limitations. I discovered that I could do more than I thought. On the left is a prairie rose flower pendant, and on the right is a necklace with a shadow darner created with polymer clay and metal. The shadow darner dragonfly is one that I frequently see flying near my pond, laying eggs in the fall. It's gorgeous. Learning how to sculpt led to the idea of adding a 3D component to my Brought to Life series. I started with my line drawing dissections, added the full color rendering, and then the sculptures along the outside. Figuring out ways to attach the sculptures was challenging, as extra wires had to be added and baked in from the beginning of creating the sculpture in order for it to be strong enough to hold up. Both of these pieces are based off of experiences and observations I've had in my garden. The perennial pea vine on the left I grow every year, and one year I found a female praying mantis lurking among the stems. She blended in so well I had to add her to this piece. On the right, leadwort blooms in late summer, early fall in our area. It attracted the beautiful white line sphinx moth several years in a row. The beauty of the blue flowers with the changing red leaves coupled with the moth was irresistible to me as an artist. After the Brought to Life series, I had a friend who wanted to de-stash some Thai silk fabric for reduced prices. It occurred to me that I could use a quilt as a background for some moth sculptures since they are the insects that use silk for their cocoons. I started with a colorful virgin tiger moth, which I had a specimen of in my collection. I researched what its larval food plant was and discovered that several were basic weeds, including chenopodium or lamb's quarters and clover. Plants make a nice abstract pattern when in masses and were a nice foil for the colorful moth. The next moth I chose was the imperial moth. I had found one of the caterpillars drowned in my pond and was surprised that these moths were found this far north. It's such a beautiful moth and the markings can be quite variable. When I work on a sculpture, I usually draw the moth first from a specimen and then use that as a basis for the sculpture. Using a specimen helps me to be able to see the moth from all angles, and I can look at it using a dissecting microscope if necessary. Since my specimens were so faded, I also did some research and found photos of live moths to get a sense of the true color. Imperial moth caterpillars feed on a variety of trees, including oak. Since I was working on this in early March, I had to use dead oak branches from the previous summer, which you can see at the top of the photo, to figure out the positioning of the leaves on the branches. I made each leaf separately, then wound them around a larger wire and covered it with another layer of polymer clay. Here is the final piece. An imperial moth is a member of the Saturnity family and they have no moth parts as adults. Consequently, the adults only live 7-10 to 10 days. In that time, they have to find a mate, find an appropriate plant to lay eggs on, and not get eaten by anything in the process. Since oak trees are one of the many larval food plants for this moth, she could be resting or preparing to lay eggs. The black background has oak leaf branches sewn in as well, and the gold border is one that befits the royalty of an imperial moth. I will say that quilts, even machine sewn ones, are a lot of intense work, so I decided to only do one more for this series. This next one would feature a spider, which also uses silk thread, but this time to build a web and capture its prey. I had been sketching spiders in the prairie and was amazed at how these large spiders were so brightly colored and yet still managed to disappear in the complex web of grasses and flowers. 
It is rather disconcerting to be bending down to look at something and discover a large spider inches from your face. Using the banded spider on the right as my inspiration, I sculpted an enlarged version. She is nearly the size of my hand and stands out on a plain background. I constructed a large web with thread, knotting and gluing every junction, and by the time I was through with that, I was impressed with how quickly spiders can create their masterpieces, usually on a nightly basis. I abstracted the different colors and textures of the prairie, put the spider on her web, and sure enough, she disappeared, or at least was less noticeable. Normally, I'd get lots of comments on a piece like this on an exhibit, but for some reason, this giant spider didn't bother them. I can only assume people didn't look carefully or just assumed it was a bunch of stripes. One of the ways that I keep my drawing skills up and find new inspiration is to sketch wherever I happen to be, whether it's my garden or vacation or a park. Having lived in Iowa and Kansas, the wide open prairie as a landscape has always filled me with awe, with its blue skies filled with clouds, menacing thunderheads rolling across empty fields, and gorgeous sunsets unbroken by trees or skylines. The prairie itself seemed grassy and ordinary, pretty enough in August with its fields of yellow sunflowers among the rust-colored grasses. But it wasn't until 2017, when I was introduced to its amazing biodiversity by Cindy Crosby's blog, Tuesdays in the Tall Grass, that I became obsessed, according to my husband. Every week, I was introduced to new flowers that were blooming, and I would race over and try to find them, sketching them along with any insects that I found. In 2019, I joined her as a volunteer at the Schulenburg Prairie at the Morton Arboretum. I learned that this prairie was a planted, restored prairie that was over 50 years old and had over 200 species of plants that had been planted there. Prairie gentians on the right are one of my favorites. I first discovered them after one of Cindy's blogs and went to draw them in the late morning. I had thought they'd stay closed like the cream ones on the left. But imagine my surprise when, in the middle of my drawing, the flowers started opening up. Fortunately, I was still in pencil stage, so I was able to change a few of them and capture that amazing blue in the center. The plants that grow here can survive fire, floods, and drought, yet still can be overtaken by shrubs, trees, and invasive plants. It's several years later and I'm still sketching and learning about prairie plants, their associated insects, and how each prairie is different. This is a fragile habitat that supports hundreds of species and it needs all of our help to survive. At first, my prairie sketches were in with all my other garden and park sketches. As I neared the end of yet another sketchbook, I wanted to be more organized in telling the story of the prairie's progression of blooms. I wanted to be able to share my discoveries and hopefully interest others in taking care of this amazing habitat. Most people see this expanse of green and assume it's all weeds and grasses with maybe a few pretty flowers. I will admit I used to think that too. Having my eyes opened on a weekly basis to what was happening in the prairie and then working there myself encouraged me to start a new sketchbook that was devoted to prairie. My first book was from Etrolab in Australia. It had smooth, thick, acid-free paper that was a joy to ink on as well as watercolor. It took a while to get used to the extra long width, but it gave me a lot of room to explore. It's always intimidating to start a new book with all those blank pages. What should I start with? How should I draw it? There were so many plants blooming, I was overwhelmed. I decided to start in the middle of the left page with a Monarda or bee balm plant. It is a pollinator magnet and has a composite flower, which means that it has a lot of simple flowers grouped together to make what looks like a larger flower. After drawing the plant, I carefully took out one of the flowers and drew it separately and added the monarch and bee later. At each successive visit, I added a new plant and decided to add any butterflies or dragonflies that I saw as written observations, so I could keep track of when they were flying. Since I started this book in the middle of summer, from the very beginning I decided to focus on the colorful flowers and just leave all the green leaves as ink lines, anything to quicken up the drying process in the heat of summer. Most of the plants were drawn from life, while the insects were done at home from my own photos from each visit or from specimens that I had. I decided to repeat the bee balm because I had seen some moths pollinating it and I wanted to show that there are several kinds of moths that fly during the day. My husband and I went and visited Orland Grasslands, a large prairie 
in the south of us. I wanted to try a little landscape, so I brought it along on my bike ride. I was just amazed at the beautiful blazing stars, but they were too complicated to draw on a bike ride, so I took lots of pictures and did them at home. As I started drawing each individual flower, I started noticing that flower shapes were very different depending on the plant, and that prairie flowers in general seemed to trend towards complicated. This really isn't a surprise, as one way to attract pollinators is to have lots of pollen or nectar, and grouping masses of small flowers together is one way of doing that. There have been many times where I've had to just take a deep breath, determine to be patient, and take one small branch at a time in order to get through a goldenrod, aster, or blazing star. On a visit to Belmont Prairie, I saw a new insect for me, a loud buzzing, large robber fly with bright iridescent green eyes. Normally I take pictures and draw later, but this fly was cooperative and very intent on laying eggs on the blazing star, so I was able to sketch her in pencil in various positions and fill in with color later. Right now is a wonderful time to be visiting prairies, as soon the monarchs and dragonflies will be massing and getting ready for their long journey south. In late August of 2019, when I visited the Schulenburg Prairie, I was amazed at the number of dragonflies swirling in the air above me. I tried counting them, but after about 40, I lost count. After taking lots of pictures, I decided to just stop, take it all in, and try to sketch the scene. I kept it loose with large brushes and after the background dried, added the dragonflies. On my next visit, I drew one of the many yellow flowers, the tall coreopsis that was still blooming in the field. Cindy's blog encouraged me to visit additional prairies and I soon enlisted my husband to join me on weekend adventures to prairies that were farther afield. Medewa National Tallgrass Prairie is one of our favorites as it's quite large, has a bison population, and attracts lots of butterflies in early September. I was able to focus long enough to draw a cluster of Maximilian sunflowers on the right before my attention was drawn away to the butterflies. Seeing fields of yellow with butterflies fluttering everywhere is always a delight to me and fills me with joy. On this particular visit, we came after a rain the previous day and the potholes in the gravel road were still filled with water and the dirt was damp. Frogs were everywhere, along with clouds of sulfurs and other butterflies, sucking up minerals from the dirt. This was definitely a time where I did take photos and sketch the butterflies later at home, as I tried to process all that I'd seen. As you can see on this page, there are lots of creatures. Spiders are starting to be more visible in September, as the females bulk up and prepare to lay eggs that will overwinter. Grasshoppers are also everywhere. I started noticing all the different colored wings, did some research, and added them to my page. One of my favorite things about the prairie, especially Springbrook Prairie, is the feeling of wide open spaces and the patterns clouds make on a blue sky. I decided to try another landscape and see if I could capture that end of summer, beginning of fall feeling. Technically it was fall, but since it was 80 degrees, it certainly felt like summer. As September wound down, I started feeling guilty that I was drawing the prairie, yet hadn't done any grasses. By this time, the grasses were nearly as tall as me, or taller, so I broke them up into sections to show their various colors and parts. The two tall ones I chose were Indian grass and big blue stem, and I also chose a small one called Side Oats Grandma. Over the two sessions that I spent on them, grasshoppers sat on my sketchbook and woolly bear caterpillars wandered across the path looking for a place to hibernate over the winter. Once the first freeze hits, most of the flowers and insects are gone. I wondered how on earth I'd find anything interesting to draw during a long winter. It's interesting, though, that when palettes and choices are limited, creativity excels. I noticed all the different seed heads that had formed on the flowers. Some were dark, and some had white fluff to carry them away in the wind and thought they would look interesting on a toned background. Even dried compass leaves are quite sculptural and beautiful in their own right. I discovered that northern harriers travel here from the north and feast on the rodents in the prairie. They have a noticeable white patch at the base of their tail, and they swoop and fly very low. 
If you want color, sunset is the time to come, especially to Springbrook Prairie. Depending on temperature and if time is short, I will draw some of my landscapes from photos, like on the left. However, as you can see, painting from photos doesn't have nearly the depth of color that my plein air sketch has on the right. Your eyes can see so many more subtle colors than a camera can record, and even though I tried to remember some of them, it's just not the same. It was below freezing when I drew the right hand sketch, so I just captured the colors loosely before my paint washes froze and did the little details at home. I had noticed the round galls of goldenrod before, but as I looked more closely in my hikes, I noticed elliptical galls and leafy galls. After some research, I learned that the leafy galls were caused by midges, elliptical ones are caused by moths, and the round ones are by flies. It was so interesting to be able to put them all side by side along with what I discovered. You never know when a winter squall will come through. I was sketching and had just blocked in the colors on the left piece when it started to snow, followed by grapple. The grapple absorbed some of the paint, leaving behind this lovely texture that looked exactly like snow. It was perfect. As winter progressed, I wanted to show the roller coaster weather we were having, so I did strips with bits of the sky and prairie in each one. It was good timing as we went from the mid 40s to minus four degrees in the space of two weeks in February. After snow and rain, prairie drop seed grasses get beaten down and end up looking like miniature haystacks. At least that's the impression I had when I came upon this section of the prairie in the left sketch. The arrival of sandhill crane signals the imminent arrival of spring to me and I was eagerly awaiting that first bright spring green shoot in the prairie. Red-winged blackbird males arrive from the south, singing their distinctive songs and establishing territories. Queen bumblebees emerge to look for nesting sites and spring flowers. We were all ready for spring to come. Unfortunately, this was 2020, and the pandemic shut down everything at the beginning of April, including the Schulenburg Prairie and quite a few of the preserves that I went to. Normally, all this dead grass and plant matter would be burned off in an early spring fire. The ash brings nutrients to the growing plants, the soil is warmed, and shrubs and small trees are killed or set back enough to let the plants have the sun that they need to grow. With the pandemic, fires were not done, so I was able to see some of the effects of that over the next growing season. I was fortunate to have a neighbor who has a prairie yard. She's been growing it for over 30 years and was even able to burn it in the spring before the shutdown. She was kind enough to let me draw and explore spring in her yard while I waited for some of the prairies to open again. I discovered prairie smoke, tiny little buttercups, and the beginnings of a compass plant emerging from the ground. Wolf Road Prairie was one of the first to open. I was able to see frogs, and the first green darner dragonflies laying eggs in the wet section of the prairie. Iridescent green tiger beetles lined the path, flying out of the way every time I took a step. It was glorious. Belmont Prairie is a remnant prairie, meaning that it has never been plowed or developed. It has an amazing diversity of plants for such a small area. Looking over the sea of dead grass that I saw when I visited, I could see small bright spots of color. Looking closer, I discovered they were hoary pecoons and white blue-eyed grass. White blue-eyed grass is an interesting name, as the, while the flowers might be white, they are not blue-eyed, nor are they grass, but instead belong to the iris family. I was amazed that these tiny spring plants could work their way through all the dead grass stalks from the previous growing season. The Schulenberg was still closed, but after we had four inches of rain, I headed over to where I could peer in through a fence at the prairie and marveled and sketched the river that Willoway Brook had become. As I waited for the Arboretum to open, I explored new prairies in my area, including Vermont Cemetery Preserve, another remnant prairie where there was a glorious display of shooting stars. The pale pink prairie phlox, yellow golden Alexander, Light blue wild hyacinths are all over the oak savanna and the edges of the prairie at Wolf Road Prairie. Since these flowers are small, I deliberately painted outside the lines to accent the beauty of the spring colors together. 
The Schulenberg Prairie finally opened again in June. It was full of spiderwort, cream wild indigo, and several varieties of native roses that I had never noticed before. Turns out that they thrive without the setback that fire gives and were extra tall this year. Once June arrives, the race is on, with plants growing and flowering as fast as they can before the next ones grow taller and shade them out. Toward the end of June, I realized that I was falling behind as the flowers got more complicated and I was seeing more and more species that I hadn't drawn yet, both of insects and plants. I couldn't believe that I hadn't done a milkweed yet, and there are so many different ones to choose from. I found a monarch caterpillar on some common milkweed along with several spiders and was able to get away with just drawing a leaf and without doing the flower. Purple milkweed has a glorious color and is not found in many prairies, so it was the highlight of my page. In studying the carrion vine flower, the globe-like flowers at the bottom, I found that the flowers are actually all male or all female. Either they have petals and stamens, like a male, or petals and pistils, like a female, whereas most flowers have both. I also discovered that the vine will only carry one or the other. So only female flowered vines will produce fruit, a globe of dark blue berries in the fall. The blank spot on the second page is reserved for butterfly weed, an orange flowered milkweed that is very attractive to butterflies and bees. In July, I heard that the state-endangered regal fritillary had been seen at Kankakee Sands in Indiana. This preserve is over two hours away and was the farthest yet that we traveled to get to a prairie. There's a large acreage set aside for conservation and many different habitats besides prairie that are being restored there. Bison are there and there's a nice overlook where you can sometimes see them. Normally, I only try to sketch one, maybe two plants, or at least leave room for that, but since we traveled so far and ended up seeing so much, I reserved a whole page for this amazing place. We hiked the Grace Taninga Discovery Trail, and rounding the bend, I saw a field of common milkweed in full bloom. Looking like mauve pom-poms going off into the distance, it was covered in monarchs, flitting from plant to plant. I had never seen that many in one place and immediately started trying to think of how I could paint that back in my sketchbook. If you've ever tried hiking with someone who stops every 10 feet to look at something and take pictures, then you can empathize with my husband. Being that it was hot and humid, I did try to keep moving, but I found a prickly pear cactus and who knew they would be in the prairie? And then a hairy pacoon, which I thought were done blooming. Seeing an antlion adult and a large Midas fly rounded out this memorable day. I hadn't seen any regal fritillaries, but there was always next year to try again. Seeing flowers and insects in masses or groups is always a treat. One cool morning in September at the Schulenberg, I was bending down to look at this obedient plant and see if it was suitable to draw when I noticed that it was filled with iridescent green sweat bees. Some were in the flowers and some were on top of the flowers. Since they are typically solitary bees, it was so fun to watch them for a while. And I was amazed that they were in a group. One by one, they would warm up, crawl out to the edge, look around and fly off. I feel so privileged to be able to still see things that I've never seen before and record them in a way that I can share with others. In mid-September, we made another trek to Kankakee Sands. The field by the bison overlook is filled with stiff goldenrod, a favorite for migrating monarchs, and I'd heard that groups of monarchs had been seen there. We went in the late afternoon and found them. I was so glad that they were still there, as you never know when the monarchs will move on. It's been a lifelong dream to see even a small group of migrating monarchs, and I was anxious to see what they do as evening approached. There were several oak trees at the top of the overlook, and we noticed that one by one, monarchs were flying over to that area. We climbed the hill and stood in awe as the trickle became a stream of butterflies, preparing to roost in the trees. Groups of monarchs would settle on a branch. As a butterfly would approach a group, the group would flutter, then calm down and look like fluttering fall leaves once again. 
This continued until it was dark, and we had to tear ourselves away and head home. It was truly amazing. Sumac was another shrub that gained ground in the prairie without fire to set it back. And while beautiful in the fall, it grows tall enough to shade the prairie plants and needs to be controlled. In late fall, the carrion vine's fruit is a beautiful dark blue on a golden leaf vine. A beautiful combination, irresistible for an artist. As I hiked through the prairie, a flurry of wings in motion caught my eye. I stealthily approached and saw a praying mantis, yet it looked different than the giant Chinese ones that I was familiar with. It had a red racing stripe down its wings and was half the size, only four inches long. An app that I use on my phone for identifying things is iNaturalist. It's pretty good and I'm able to keep track of everything that I see there and compare lists from year to year. So iNaturalist ID'd this mantis as a European mantis, yet another non-native, but another new species for me. Another new species that day was a giant leopard moth caterpillar. It was the size of my thumb but longer and very prickly. It was crawling along the path, so I gently set it aside and it crawled into the tangle of plants and disappeared. These guys hibernate as caterpillars, emerge in the spring to continue feeding, and then pupate and emerge later in the summer. I was nearing the end of my prairie sketchbook and had to decide whether to continue or not. Sketching during the pandemic had provided a lot of peace of mind during turbulent and anxious times. All of my classes and exhibits had been canceled. Yet even though I had gone to various prairies nearly 70 times, I still was discovering new things and was yet to be bored. Going out to the prairie on a regular basis to sketch had kept me motivated and drawing, so I decided to do one more book, but this time it would be a vertical format. I started the new book in late November and was treated to my first sighting of short-eared owls. They migrate down from the north along with the northern harriers and will stay as long as there is enough food before migrating further south. They are such a treat to watch. They swoop and swirl and resemble giant moths in the twilight before sunset. When frost and ice coat the prairie and turn it into a winter wonderland, it's almost more beautiful than summertime. Almost. Lots of snow and cold weather in February made sketching difficult, so I chose to write more and sketch from photos and my memory. Sketching at 10 and 12 degrees is too cold even for me. We had so much snow that it was still deep when we had a break and it hit 43 degrees. It felt balmy out. I still bundled up, yet I was grateful that I could paint the beauty of snow and shadow in comparatively warm temperatures. I was at the Schulenberg drawing dead grasses when the first waves of sandhill cranes started flying over. I abandoned them and began working on the sky and clouds, penciling in a formation and then painting it, as I always love my first sign of spring. This spring saw fires bring rejuvenating growth as two years worth of plant material was burnt away. I actually managed to catch the fire at my neighbor's prairie and was able to see how fast it moves, eating up the dead plants, trailing smoke behind it. I missed the Schulenberg Prairie fire by one day, but could still smell the smoke. In April, my neighbor called me with news that her past flowers were blooming. This is one of the first spring prairie flowers to bloom. It's covered with white hairs on its petals and its leaves, and is so pale and just beautiful. I've been waiting two years to sketch them, so I raced over and settled in to draw, attracting the next door neighbor's kids in the process. I had missed seeing and drawing them in my other book due to the pandemic, and was so grateful to see them again. Nechusa Grasslands is another large preserve that has restored as well as remnant prairies, along with a bison population. These prairies support rare and endangered species of bumblebees, butterflies, and plants. I've been learning about bumblebees over the past couple of years and find them fascinating. They buzz pollinate shooting stars by vibrating their thoracic muscles. This produces high frequency vibrations that cause pollen to bounce inside the anther and eventually be propelled outside and onto the bee's body, fertilizing the plant at the same time. Other plants that use this method are tomatoes, potatoes, and eggplant. 
Honeybees are unable to do this, so these plants rely on our native bees for pollination. In May, I was able to visit Illinois Beach State Park and see a sand prairie with its unusual plants, including the Scarlet Indian Paintbrush and the three Pacoons, Hairy, Hoary, and Fringed. Another project that Cindy Crosby started at the Schulenberg Prairie was to start surveying moths using a black light and a sheet. Starting in June, a group of us have been meeting monthly and photographing the moths and other insects that show up to the black light. I've always loved the larger moths, but I was surprised that the tiny ones were equally as patterned and quite beautiful. I was amazed at the diversity in color and shapes of these moths and decided to add them to my sketchbook as well. There are nearly eight times as many moths as butterflies, and not much is known about their importance as pollinators. Several of the moths found have been directly linked to the prairie, as their caterpillars feed on lead plant, asters, and grasses. One of my favorites is the wavy-lined emerald moth, the bright green one at the top. Its caterpillar is the camouflage looper, and is known for attaching pieces of the plant it's feeding on to its body with silk. This includes petals, which it will remove when wilted and replace with fresh ones. After learning about this caterpillar, I was able to go find some at the Schulenberg and see this for myself. It was so fun to find them. Moths are not the only insects that show up to a light sheet, of course. Here are some beetles that we found. The top left is an oriental beetle, a non-native scarab beetle. Next to it is a native longhorn beetle called the ivory marked borer. It infests dead hardwood trees like hickory, locust, and ash. They aren't considered pests though because they don't attack live trees. On the bottom left is some type of water beetle and in the corner is a type of nut weevil. This is probably a female because her snout is as long as her body. At the end of it is her mouth which she uses to chew a hole into a nut where she lays her egg. We also found lots of bugs and leaf hoppers. The one on the left at the top is called the long-necked seed bug. Next to it is a cool tree hopper with horns. The other three are leaf hoppers. The two leaf hoppers at the bottom were tiny, probably around three millimeters in length. It took taking a photo with my camera and blowing it up for me to see the cool designs that they carried on their wings. Larger insects arrived also. Katie Dids, a giant caddisfly on the right, and at the bottom right was my favorite, a mantid fly. This unusual insect belongs to the order Neuroptera, which is the same order as lace wings. To me, it looks like someone stuck a mantis onto a lace wing, but this group of insects just developed raptorial arms that grab and catch just like a mantis, all on their own. They have an interesting life cycle in that the larvae are parasitic on wolf spider eggs. The mantid fly lays hundreds of eggs under leaves. After hatching, the larvae drop down and have to somehow attach themselves to a passing spider, preferably a female. Then they have to wait until she starts to construct an egg sac and get inside before she seals it, all without being noticed. Once it's sealed inside the sac with the eggs, it feeds on them as needed until it is ready to pupate and emerge. The process from egg to adult takes about a year. Adults feed on small insects that are attracted to flowers. I was hoping to see it feed, but while it looked interested and stretched its arms out, nothing happened. It was a very exciting find for me as I'd heard of them but had never seen one. Keeping a nature journal is something artists, scientists, and explorers have been doing for centuries. Whether you write more or draw more, direct observations written in the moment are more accurate than using your memory later. Trends can be observed over time, discoveries can be made, and connections between plants and animals can be seen when time is spent outside with a sketchbook. When you stop to sketch or write, birds and insects will see you as non-threatening and you may have unexpected encounters that are thrilling. There is time to look closely at details that might be missing in a photo, such as the underside of a leaf or how it's connected to the stem. Curiosity leads to questions which can lead to learning new information. 
If you are new to nature journaling, a great resource is the Laws Guide to Nature Drawing and Journaling by John Muir Laws. He gives loads of advice, tips, and ways to think about your journal that will expand how you think about observing nature. He also has a website, johnmuirlaws.com, that has videos and articles on how to draw out in nature. Everyone has supplies that they are comfortable using, and of course the best ones are the ones that you use. So what do I use? The packet on the left is basically my studio on the go. I have taken it all over the world and used it in all kinds of weather. There are micron pens of different sizes and colors, a white gel pen, white gouache, and a white colored pencil. All the latter are for adding white hairs or highlights. I also have a variety of brushes and clips for holding my watercolor palette onto my sketchbook and a watercolor palette. However, if I'm hiking and need to lighten up, then the items on the right are the most essential things that I take that can easily fit into a small plastic bag. They include a pencil, eraser, Micron .005 ink pen, watercolor palette, paper towel, and a water brush. I use a refillable watercolor palette with four yellows, three blues, I do a lot of green, quinacridone magenta, quinacridone rose, burnt sienna, phthalo green, and quinacridone gold for fall color. Everything that I've painted in my sketchbooks was done using these colors, and it's amazing how much variety you can get with a limited palette. I've even painted in the rainforest with this set. In terms of sketchbooks, I prefer ones that open flat. Less expensive books will have spirals like the ones on the right or thinner paper. Honestly, you can get used to just about anything, but if you know you want to use lots of water, then get a book with thicker paper so that the paper will stay flat when you paint on it. I've completed probably close to a dozen spiral notebooks over the years, and each one holds lots of special memories. Another thing to consider is finding one with acid-free paper so that the pages won't turn yellow and brittle as they age. If you're beginning, start small. You can fit a surprising number of observations in a small book, and it will be easier to carry around. If it's not with you, you won't ever draw or write in it. I keep a backpack with my supplies stored in it so that when I leave for the prairie, I just pick it up and go. I don't have to waste time looking for supplies or discovering that I'd forgotten something once I got there. This is my summer prairie adventure outfit. Even on the hottest days, I will wear long pants tucked into my socks in order to avoid being bitten by ticks and chiggers. I normally sit on a folding stool, but these plants were small enough that I had to sit on the rocky ground in order to see them. Also important is to wear a hat for sun protection along with lotion and bug spray. In the winter, it's layers, layers, layers. The warmer I am, the longer I can stay out and explore. Pencils work great when it's freezing, unless of course it's snowing and the paper is damp. Watercolors will work for a short time, but when the paper and water in your brush freeze, then interesting textures happen on your paper, and sometimes the paint strokes will just stay on top and not soak in. It can get a little frustrating. I've tried adding alcohol to the water, and that makes interesting effects also. Either way, it's a race against time before your supplies freeze up, which sometimes helps me to focus and prioritize exactly what I want to remember whether it's footprints in the snow or the shape of a curling leaf. There are many challenges to drawing outside. The weather, biting bugs, onlookers wondering what you're doing, changing light, wind. Your subject changes or decides to leave. Your supplies can be affected by humidity and carrying materials can be tiring or awkward. However, on the plus side, you're in the moment concentrating and focused, forced to make quick decisions. You have accurate color and form in front of you, as opposed to using photographs. You can practice for studio work, see interesting birds and animals, and you'll have improved memory of your subject, especially if you're traveling, rather than just taking a photo and moving on. Slowing down to observe, followed by writing or drawing, helps your mind to keep sharp as it uses both the logic and creative sides of your brain. 
Here's an example of how I go about working in my sketchbook. The weather on this day was hot and humid, and I knew that I wouldn't be able to last long in the sun. Cup plants were blooming beautifully, and I noticed a patch of them under a tree, so that at least I'd have a bit of shade until the sun shifted. Cup plants have interesting leaves that form a cup at the base of the flowering stems. When it rains, the area holds water that birds and insects can drink from. It's a diagnostic part of the plant, so I knew I wanted to include that part, along with the flowers. I quickly drew a rough sketch of the general shape of the flowers and stems to make sure they'd fit on the page. Then I started inking in the flowers, leaves, and stems, starting in the front and working my way to the back. Since I've been doing this for several years now, I'm fairly confident with my strokes and less worried about making mistakes. If the weather had been cooler, I might have spent more time on the pencil drawing. As you can see several areas where I misjudged and have intersecting ink lines that should be overlapping instead. That is one reason I carry a white gel pen, as I can do some corrections with it if the mistakes are bad enough to warrant it. Since these are not scientific or botanical illustrations, I'm not measuring or using any rulers. I'm after the essence of the plant, along with any necessary identifying characteristics that will tell people what it is. I don't mind showing holes in the leaves or imperfect flowers, as that is the way nature is. Sometimes my hand shakes too, or my stems are not even over the whole length. Since this is my sketchbook and I want the pages to be lively, I don't view these imperfections as the end of the world, otherwise I would never draw again. It is why I draw a lot of the insects at home though, because I want them to pop off the page and a crooked antenna would ruin that effect. The next stage is to attach my watercolor palette to my sketchbook and put the first layer of watercolor on. By this time it's quite hot so that it doesn't take long for the paint to dry and I can do the next layer which includes the dark shadow portions of the cup-like leaves. Once I've finished that, I usually take a photo with my subject to see if I'm at least close to the right flower color. If not, I add more paint. I also take the photo to remind myself of which ones were painted live and to be able to share them on social media. In the middle of drawing my flower, I caught some movement in the periphery of my vision and was distracted by the sight of this amazing black and white grasshopper. I took several photos of him and watched him for a while, and then tore myself away to get back to my painting. I'd also found a carrion beetle earlier in the day, so when I got home, I added both of them to my page. Later in the week, I visited Springbrook Prairie in Naperville, and had just enough time to pencil in some prairie dock before leaving. I took notes of some of the pollinators that I saw, as well as some color notes for later. My next visit to the Schulenburg, I was determined to draw the cream gentian. It's one of my favorite flowers, and I'd seen it the week before, but couldn't handle the intense sun that it was sitting in. This visit was a bit cooler, so that I could handle drawing in the sun. While I was drawing, a large bumblebee started forcing open the flowers, crawling in and searching for pollen and nectar. The flowers are large enough to cover the bee, so that it looks like there's something living inside the flower as the bee moves around. It's always amusing for me to watch, and I was able to follow it around as it focused on moving from flower to flower. Later that week, I added another gentian, including the bumblebee, to remind myself of that fun experience. This is the spread as it stands right now. There is a bit of a blank spot on the right side that needs something, and my words are penciled in in case they need to be moved. I saw a cool ambush bug on a flower that day, which will probably fill the spot nicely. You'll have to stay tuned on Instagram to see what I put there. So to summarize, here's some sketchbook tips. Take a moment to sit and observe around you. Note any sounds, smells, or sights. I find it helpful to acknowledge the weather if it's bad and make adjustments to blunt the worst of it. You can think, Okay, it's 100 degrees out here, and I'm not going to be able to stick, stick this out for very long, so I'm only going to write or draw for 10 minutes, or 5 minutes. You'll find your brain 
then can handle focusing for that short amount of time, and then you can go. Decide your subject. What excites you about where you are? The landscape? A plant? A flower? An insect or a bird? If nothing, don't force it. Just enjoy your time in that place. Decide what excited you or drew you to that subject and how you can express that on your page. Think about how to use contrasting values, textures, lines, patterns, or color to accent your subject matter. This is where using a smaller book helps in that you have only one subject to worry about. You can then decide how much detail you want to add. Once you've decided your subject, quickly sketch in your desired medium. Don't be afraid to use multiple media. Don't be afraid to make mistakes. Keep it simple to start by blocking in main shapes first and adding detail as you have time. Remember to think about your focal point and not lose why you chose the subject. If, for example, you chose yellow flowers because they reminded you of a bouquet of sunshine, make sure that color stands out and write it down if necessary. In the case of this dragonfly sketch, I love the gold of the flowers along with the soaring dragonflies, and to be honest, they were fighting each other just a bit. Which is more important to me, the gold of the flowers or the dragonflies? If I were to do a final piece of this, I'd have to knock back the yellow a bit visually or add some detail to some of the dragonflies in order to bring them forward. But as a sketch, it does its job of reminding me of a beautiful fall day on the prairie. Feel free to add words if you want. Describe the weather, plant names, or anything you particularly want to remember. I remember feeling a bit poetic and added that to my sketch as it doesn't happen all that often. I wrote, surrounded by a sea of gold, green darners float and swirl in the sky above. In the end, just enjoy the process and don't worry about the end result. The point is to be in nature, observe, learn, and capture some of that as that moment will never be the same again. As an artist, I use different media to show the beauty and diversity of what I've discovered in my prairie adventures. Copper and polymer clay make a bumblebee nest locket or a dragonfly necklace. Silk, thread, and polymer clay show how brightly colored spiders disappear among the prairie plants. Acrylic on canvas shows how a bumblebee pollinates a blue gentian. Watercolor and ink are transportable and allow me to draw plein air becoming one with the landscape and allowing the creatures around me to forget I'm there. Every time I walk the prairie, there is something new to see, a plant texture, an insect hiding, or a pattern of clouds in the sky. Sharing these discoveries through my art will hopefully encourage others and you to get out and make your own discoveries wherever you live. Thanks for watching.